Justin Mur- Murphy, PhD, is a political scientist whose research has been published in peer-reviewed journals. He he's received a PhD from Temple University in 2014 before teaching political science at the University of Southampton, where he was a permanent lecturer. In 2019, he left academia to focus on research and teaching. He now works full-time independently as a creator on the internet. Well done. Did we get that correct? <laughs> Sounds about right. Sounds good. Well, I mean, I feel like we... I topic that I'm really interested in to start with is creating on the internet mm. since that's what you've been doing for the past three years. It's what I've been doing on and off since I was 13 years old. And I'm curious what your present day thoughts are on creators in on the internet in 2022. Great question. I could say many things. One of my talking points here is that I think what is called the creator economy is, is very underrated. And we have all of these euphemisms for this new culture or this new phenomenon, which I think just really understates where all of this is going. So for instance, you know, even the phrase creator economy, I've never really liked that. The phrase creator, I've never liked that. And the one I hate the most is what people call just like community, you know, community <laughs> building. I just find that these are all very trivial sounding uh, euphemisms. And to me, really what we're talking about here is the early stages of essentially individuals and groups who fork the civilizational code base is essentially what creators and their communities are doing together. It's saying, here's the inherited code base that defines what society was. And actually, we don't like that. We want it to be a little different. We want different values. We want we have different beliefs. We think fundamentally different things are true. And we have a fundamentally different sense of what life should feel like and look like. And the creator is the one who basically articulates that vision. And the audience, which then becomes the community, and then the, the creator and the community morph into this hive mind, that entity is really a fork of society itself. And when you think about it that way, it's much more significant than, you know, just making videos or building a community. It's essentially a kind of statesmanship. It, it's essentially political at its core, because it is ultimately going to compete with the shared status quo social code base. And I think that's what we're seeing is a, a proliferation of society uh, versions, different versions of society essentially forking off from the main one. So I think it's much more radical and much more significant and ult- ultimately more conflictual and militant even than people w- would think it is based on these euphemistic uh, terms that we uh, tend to use right now. If creator is not the right term and it's way bigger deal than just creators – and the creator economy, what are the right terms to frame the argument? Right. Well, one that's gaining currency is this idea of the network state. And I think that this moves the ball forward a little bit. I think actually even that term tends to understate it in a way, but that definitely gets us closer to the reality of, I think, what what's really going on with all of this. I think the fundamental idea of that proposition is that these community online communities at a certain level of intensity will essentially take on their own economies, take on their own laws and represent something like what we think of today as, as the, the historical nation state. So I think that is is getting us closer to a, a correct kind of terminology and mental model of where the creator economy and communities are really going. What got you interested in this to begin with? What? what exactly. The creators and First creators, I assume it's coming from a place of, oh, I, I'd like to do that myself. Right. But then the broader landscape of where this is going. When yeah. did you get involved in thinking like that? For, for me, it was really from my history and personal experience as a professor. You know, when I was, all I've ever wanted to be was a, a scholar, a professor. I actually just was home for to see family. And my grandmother told me a story that I didn't, I never heard this until uh, a few weeks ago when she told me, she said that when I was five years old, she asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I said, I wanted to be a scholar at five years old. I mean, I don't know how many five-year-old, five-year-olds even know like what exactly a scholar is. Somehow I got into, into my head. I didn't even know that. But I remember when I was in university, I just knew I didn't want to work a normal job you know, in a business doing kind of uh, typical mundane money-making things. I just knew all my life that I just wanted to be a, a scholar, professor, whatever you want to call it. And I busted my ass to, to succeed in that highly competitive economy. And, and I did. And I, I got the coveted, you know, research-based tenure track job and I made it. And it just wasn't at all what I had in mind. It wasn't at all the, the, the inner calling that I had since I was maybe five years old. 
and I looked out at the internet and I was like, oh, you know what? This is a much more promising vector mm. to actually carve out and build and 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 create a truly autonomous, free spirited um, life container where it would be economically uh, and socially impactful and sustainable for me to actually have a a robust, influential and sustainable personal intellectual life. And and it was just clear that the creator economy offered a uh, a, a more promising container for that than the traditional professorship that I had, you know, worked really hard to get and, and was, was lucky to be successful in, in obtaining. So that was, that was, that's always been my motivation from day one, you know, uh, whether it's like writing the newsletter or the YouTube or the podcast, I just see it all as essentially for, for my use case, I'm just trying to carve out for myself an economically sustainable little pod for me to do what essentially what I was doing as a professor. Hmm. And who were some of the people you looked at at that time who you said, oh, that person's doing it right. I'd like to be like that. Yeah, it's a good question. Pro I mean, maybe it's not a good question, actually, because it's probably <laughs> – my answer is probably all the f famous people you already know of and a lot of the, you know, big leading kind of case studies, right? Yeah, sure, like the Tim Ferrisses and the Joe Rogans, of course, like all of these kind of well-known I, – I, I don't know that I have – you know, any uh, interesting hidden case study or, or, or role model that that really inspired me. But it was just looking out at this larger phenomenon. And it was just clear that there was some way to 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 do it, to, I guess, not to give myself too much credit, but there weren't too many people doing a kind of more sophisticated academic play on this on this um, dimension or in this new domain. You know, Jordan Peterson, uh, you know, interesting, of course, very compelling, probably the single most successful case study of the academic type of personality uh, who who navigated this transition from, you know, a relatively minor political scientist in Canadian academia. He was very competent, you know, very, uh, you know, very good political scientist, no disrespect at all, uh, actually published a lot of really interesting papers, which I was actually familiar with somewhat as, as a scholar, even before he was famous. But I, I do remember, I guess this is an interesting story. I can remember finding Jordan Peterson on YouTube way before he was famous. And I wasn't like, you know, watching it that much. I, I, I was busy, you know, developing my career as an academic, but this is while I was a professor. I remember seeing his, his lecture videos and noticing they were starting to get a little bit of traction. You know, I was like, Oh, that's kind of interesting. Like, this is pretty cool. And then when I saw him blow up, that was probably a very powerful kind of um, learning experience that really made me update my model uh, of the world and made me think like, oh, wow, this is I should take this more seriously and think about this model. What were you thinking before and what were you thinking after? Well, I had always just assumed that the right way to the, the best way and the right way to have a long-term, successful, influential, public intellectual life is to be a professor. And that's all I ever wanted. That's all I was ever aiming for. And, uh, you know, I paid my dues, like I said, for for many years to, to get into that perch. Mm -hmm. And it was just not what I wanted at all. Um, and so that was like the big updating. Basically, I, I realized I had to I was just eat, motivated to find a different model, to find a different way of, of moving forward and advance, you know, just pursuing that vision, pursuing that career, just keep going. But I had to find some kind of, you know, creative, creative departure because it just felt very clearly that academia was a dead end. I just, I hate, I just didn't like it. Like it, temperamentally, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Um, even though I was quite successful and, um, yeah. So when I saw people like Jordan Peterson kind of doing this thing, I was kind of like, you know, I think we're at the beginning of something new and it basically just made me feel like I don't, I don't think anyone at the time, no one really knew because I was three or four years ago that I kind of made that wager that I would be able to figure it out. But to be honest, you know, even Jordan Peterson is not really a good case study in a way because he's he's just an, an outlier, right? It's mm. like, that's not a realistic playbook for an, a professor to just try to be the next Jordan Peterson. That's not that's not realistic. That's a statistical anomaly, right? Um, so I knew that I wasn't going to just be able to be the next, I had no aspiration to be the next Jordan Peterson or anything. But it was more like it showed me that surely there are other things you can do more purposefully. And I was like, I'm pretty sure just looking at the numbers, like I could have a big enough audience and use enough monetization options to create some kind of system where I'm basically making as much money as I was as a professor, but had um, way more freedom and autonomy and, and could have more fun as well doing it. Um, and that was the wager that I made. At the time, there wasn't really anyone who proved that 
um, I like to think in my own little way, I kind of did, you know, pioneer a, a, a realistic reproducible playbook. Um, and, and that's what I've been doing over the past few years. So, so, but I, it was just a wager at the time. Yeah. Well, I, I'd love to get into the playbook, but before we do, I want to talk about the downsides you've written about Jordan Peterson's talked about the downsides of putting out content and being yeah. well known, but you were talking about the yeah. downsides to putting out content in general that we don't really know the effects of. Mm. And you, the quote you have here is constant public posting produces a set of negative psychological side effects. We continue to underestimate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there are failure modes in all things. Right. And so when you go all in on the internet, especially if you're leaving this kind of uh, institutional cushy prestige perch uh, of something like academia, one of the failure modes is getting just mentally destroyed by the, the, the psychologically uh, torturing, you know, user interfaces and web apps and uh you know this this little cocoon of of web services and platforms that you build for yourself you know this little pod if you will as i said before that pod can start to overtake you in certain ways and it has its own it has its own risks psychologically and emotionally you know to do good work on the internet you maybe you've experienced this yourself you have to be incredibly detached and uh you have to protect your your clear thinking, your free spirit. You have to really maintain a good headspace and do a lot of things like reading and doing interesting things off of the internet is often the best way to be successful on the internet. But when you're all in on the internet as your as the way that you publish your work and, and that's how you that's how you exist in a way to the public sphere, there's this risk of just getting sucked into the internet. And when you're sucked into the internet, you're not going to be thinking good stuff. You're not going to be writing good stuff. You're, and you're going to become a kind of just... Um, your shoulder, your shoulders are going to crunch up. You're gonna, and you're going to become this kind of conformist um, automaton that's basically just glued to these uh, psychologically manipulative user interfaces, basically. So that's the pitfall, and that, and that's a constant struggle, I think, for anyone who's ser a serious creator. Uh, it really is a serious problem. Again, it's it's easy to think of this as a trivial, you know, commonplace or like a hackneyed observation, but it's it's not. It's actually essential and crucial to successfully maintaining a, you know, a, a thoughtful life uh, and, and being successful as a creator is not getting sucked into those things. Yeah. I was talking to someone recently and they, they commented, oh, I realized that all my thoughts are just products of TikTok. <laughs> and I said, oh, that's an interesting insight. And you're, you're, that person wasn't a creator on the internet, but they believed or realized that so much of what they believe is just what is fed It's to them. so true. I mean, it's really, there's a risk of actual mental enslavement, basically. If mm. you're not careful, you really can, uh, uh, before you know it, all of your thoughts are coming to you from the podcast you listen to and, and so on. And it's a real risk. If you're not careful, you will fall into that trap. I mean, the these platforms and, and services are designed to make you, to, to consume you, to enslave you. It's basically what they're designed to designed to do. Uh, and the more you're focused on producing for the internet and the more ambitious you are as a creator, the greater the risk of that stuff happening is. And so, yeah, again, it's, it's easy to reduce that to a euphemism or just, you know, uh, consider that a trivial fact, but, it, but it's not, it's like a life or death problem really for creators and thinkers and writers, I think. And for people in general. Totally. So what do we do to build in more solitude, more reading time? How do you get to a place where you can be a thinker that has multiple perspectives and you're not just conformed to the narrative that you hear and see often on the internet? Yeah, it's a good question. There are a few possible answers I might give. One would have to do with novel and improved technological systems we could talk about a little bit. But one that I might just start with is I think the benefit and advantage of private community is important here because in a way the private community that you build around yourself online can be and should be if if really optimized correctly it can be a kind of replacement for the algorithmic public sphere hmm. and i think when you're actually just thinking reading writing talking with interlocutors and peers who you know personally who you respect and who you have ongoing live human interactions and discourse with it that alone, I think, can be a real bulwark against these threats because it's it's a different type of motivational system in a way. It's like, you know, when you're trying to make sense with your friends and you're trying to impress your friends in this kind of private, um, pr private, relaxed, but also semi-professional, semi-competitive 
private community of of interlocutors and peers who you respect, it tends to produce a good kind of competitive, you know, um, perhaps somewhat addictive, perhaps somewhat, you know, dopaminergically driven uh, system, but in a way that you can uh, cultivate and control a little bit more and, and, and kind of uh, optimize for the values and the tendencies and the ethics and the aesthetics that you actually believe in, rather than having that done for you by, you know, like the, the Twitter corporate board or whatever, you know what I'm saying? And so I see, I see private community and this, this, this big shift towards private community all the way up to things like network states as really one solution to this problem, because yeah, build, build the communities and the interactive systems that you need to maximize your productivity and your, your creative output, but do it in a group of a hundred to a thousand people that you really respect using, you know, systems and tools that are, you know, pared down for you to optimize the intellectual or aesthetic or emotional or whatever goals you all have. That, that to me is one massive um, uh, possible solution. Yeah. And then the other I would say is, is actually taking back control over our, you know, technological systems basically. And so I think what is today called web three is one, you know, exciting uh, Vista or, or, or frontier, if you will, that, that this will be worked out on. You know, I'm interested in very specific projects like Urbit, you might be aware of. Urbit is a very novel and incredibly disruptive uh, attempt to pretty much overthrow the, the the computing stack as we know it and actually take back our computers, right? Like our computers today are, are pretty much owned by Apple. You don't really own your MacBook. You kind of buy it, but then you're actually renting it because all of the data is stored in iCloud and it's, you know, you're, you're owned. We're all owned. We're all owned by Apple. Um, we have no control over our own computing and data, uh, whether it's Apple or Facebook or what have you. Um, and so, yeah, I'm interested in radical projects that attempt to kind of rewire this stuff from, from the ground up. Urbit is, Urbit is one example. We can talk more about that if you're interested, but, uh, yeah, those I would say are the, are kind of the two main bulwarks against these threats is, is, is cohesive increasingly optimized and um, authentic private communities, and then actually taking back power over the network and computing stacks that, that we use on a day to day basis. What happened where at one point the internet was supposed to be this place where freedom would reign supreme, and yeah. eventually gets overtaken. And you have the companies that are the startups <clears throat> eventually become the companies that are, quote unquote, our overlords, you could take the quotes out if you'd like. But I'm yeah. curious from your perspective as somebody who's a little bit older than me and has seen the evolution and clearly is very interested in this mm -hmm. topic, what happened exactly? Yeah, I can tell you what happened. What happened is that personal computers as we know them were not built to be networked. So the internet, when the internet emerged, it was this kind of uh, naturally evolved system or architecture. You probably know the the cartoon canned history how it grew out of military research darpa and so on at that time um you know there were mainframe computers right so so there's mainframe computers these big massive expensive things that only like big you know organizations could have then on those mainframe computers emerges this uh kind of uh, haphazard slowly growing internet architecture with the protocols that we know of today, like HTTP and SMTP, SMTP and all of these things that now define what is the current internet stack. But that internet stack was, as I said, um, it, it evolved or emerged on top of these mainframe computers. Then comes the personal computer revolution, right? So if you think about that, the personal computers that we have were made in the context of an internet that itself was built for the, with the mainframes in mind. Okay. And so what is that? Why does this matter? Or, or, you know, where, where am I going with this, with this kind of, you know, convoluted, uh, weird, obscure, uh, history. The reason this really matters is because what it means is that personal computers, which came after this, um, internet stack that we have today are, were never made to be networked. Mm. And so for our computers to network, how do we have to do it? We have to run through big corporations. It's mm. the only way that makes sense with the current with the internet's current architecture so that's essentially the problem is for for millions or billions of people to share messages on something like twitter or facebook you need to have companies that run the servers right because our 
browsers and our computers are our clients, right? That that connect to these servers, but the servers are are massive and and hugely expensive. But that client server relationship, that client server architecture is just an artifact of that internet networking stack, which was based on this old mainframe world of of the big mainframe computers. Okay, so that architecture, the client server, the client server architecture doesn't need to be how the internet is organized. That doesn't need, there's nothing saying that that's how we have to design our networking, right? So the reason I'm interested in projects like Urbit is because Urbit basically comes along and says, well, wait a minute, what if we just redesigned the personal computer in a way that all these computers could talk with all of the others? So we don't need to go through these big servers. What if every computer was just made to be a server from scratch? There's no technical reason why you can't have that. The only reason we don't have it today on our default, you know, personal computers is because of this weird, convoluted, obscure internet computing history and the way that things, the, th the way that things tended to work um, arbitrarily or contingently in the, in the messiness of history. Basically, the reason the internet today is so bad is an accident, essentially. And so Urbit and other kind of radical projects like Urbit basically say, what if we just rewrote everything from scratch so this so that this made sense? And we actually all had control over our computers and our data and our networks. Mm. What what would you say to somebody who says, well, I don't think that the internet is actually so bad? Yeah, well, of course, it's amazing in so many ways, for sure. But it's kind of like Stockholm Syndrome. You, we, we, we kind of don't uh, know what we're missing in a way, or we so naturalized the abuses and the limitations of the current internet architecture because... It is so new and it is so amazing. You know, the internet as we have it today compared to not having the internet is amazing, right? It's awesome. But that's not the most useful counterfactual. The counterfactual is comparing the internet we have today to what it could be in mm. like within the limits of technical possibility uh, if we simply redesigned it differently. And yeah, that, so that's why that's why I'm interested in, in projects like Urbit because I do think it's actually possible to fundamentally rewire our computers and our networks in a way that is all about protecting our minds, protecting our, our uh, relationships, protecting our private data. And, and basically at the end of the day, what it's about is you and your friends should be able to do what you want to do with your computers. Mm. You should be able to build software together. Why can't you build software together? Why can't you and the people who listen to your podcast make a custom community experience where you're building software together? Have you ever stopped? People don't stop to think like, why can't you do that? It shouldn't be that hard, right? It's just moving data around, right? Um, there's, there's no reason you can't do that. There's only the accidental reason you can't do that, which is that the way things are currently architected, you have to basically put everything on a server and it's really expensive. So then you have to have VC backing to be able to you know, fund it, right? But there's no reason in principle why normal people can't be artisanal you know, software craftsmen together in small communities. I, I'm trying to understand the use case yeah. for me to use <laughs> Urbit because as someone who's really never <laughs> no, looked well, into it. No, I, I wouldn't try to convince you. I wouldn't try to convince you. Um, it's never. It's that's always like a beta. That's a that's a beta male posture to try. To, I, I never try to convince anyone of anything. Uh, if you want to, if you want to check it out, you can. But frankly, like no, no. no explain uh, to me, like yeah. as a non-programmer, <laughs> yeah, non-technical yeah. person, yeah. like what is the use for me to to get on Urbit? Right. Right. Well. At the moment, it's very early. It's, gotcha. a, it's a very kind of radical vision in the early days. So this is why I don't, I don't, I don't try to convince anyone to, to get on. And I'm not, you know, I'm not here to sell it. And I, I, I'm not, um, you know, I don't really care if people are into it or not. But you're interested. Well, in yeah, it. yeah, for and, sure. So and I'm you happy see to the vision, right, right. So I'm happy to talk about it for sure, and I'm happy to kind of describe it because it sounds like people are interested in it when I talk about it. So. Um, yeah, at the moment it's very early days right now. It just kind of feels like discord, you know, anyone, anyone like you know, and you don't have to have any programming skills or anything can, can get a ship, boot up your ship and then get on the network and poke around. It looks and feels like discord. It's, it's like a decentralized peer to peer discord. So, uh, every computer, like I said, is its own server. There is no server owned by some big company. It's literally everyone's computer sending messages to everyone else's computer in this decentralized mesh net. Uh, but it looks and feels like discord right now, but for you, for someone like you, and maybe for people listening to this podcast, my favorite, you know, illustration of why you're going to be interested in Urbit and why you're going to want to get on Urbit as things develop is just think about right now how many logins you manage. Yeah. Right. We all crazy. nowadays we have that's why we all need tools like one password or whatever. And, and, and lo and behold, we're paying more every month just to be able to man. We have to pay for a, a, a company to help us manage the number of passwords we have. Right. It's, it's pretty crazy when you start to really see this, you start to see like, oh, wow. Yeah. All of the current Internet is just 
problem stacked on top of problem. And our only way out of the problem is to pay some new company to solve the problem. If, when you start to see this, you start, you can't look away. You're going to start noticing this more after we, after today. And so, um, start there. Think about all the logins you have, you manage. There's no reason why you need to have all of these logins. Mm. Think about it. On when, when you log into Facebook with one login, you have a social graph on Facebook that's in the databases owned by Facebook. Then you go to Twitter and you log in. You have a separate social graph on Twitter that's owned in the databases owned and controlled by Twitter. But at the, at the, at the end of the day, our social graph is our social graph. I only, ha I only have one social graph. I only need one social graph, right? It's literally just the map of who I'm friends with my friend, my family, my coworkers, right? Every one person has one social graph and they only need to have one social graph. Why is it that we have to have 100 separate social graphs, which are somewhat the same, similar, but also a little bit different in each app. And it's a nightmare, right? Like think about the people who listen to your podcast, who want to talk with you, hang out with you. You know, you have to kind of decide where you want to send them, right? Yeah. You, you have to say, you have to, you have to either decide to build your community on discord or build your community on a Facebook app or build it on some other app. But once you build that community, you're kind of stuck there, right? Because it's really hard to move. You know, if some new app comes around, that's really cool that you all want to play with together. Guess what? You can't mm -hmm. because it's too, there's too much friction. It's too hard. You know, a good example of this was, I remember Clubhouse. Remember when Clubhouse was very buzzy? Clubhouse was a really cool app. When it hit the scene, it was really fun. It was an interesting model. Uh, no one had really like made that type of audio listening community experience. It was really fun and cool. And I remember when Clubhouse came out, I was like, oh, I want to bring all my community onto here to mess around with it because it's really cool. And it was immediately clear, like, no, you can't even bother unless you want to get like a, a two weeks of your life carved out simply to herd cats and like beg them to make a new login and, and meet me in this room. And here's a link and you have to send five follow-up emails. And then even still, after a, a week of your life, you're uh, only going to get like 25% of your people to actually move over to there, right? So, so this is just a, a, a good colorful example of how communities are radically inhibited from what they can do together using software. Um, there's no reason why if a new app shift ships, we should be able, all of, you and all of your friends should be able to immediately go find each other in that app. And that's what Urbit, that's what Urbit is going to provide. And it already does in, in the early stages. So on Urbit, you only have one login. Yeah. You only have one login. You're on the network and anytime a new app ships, you just tell your friends, hey, download this app and you all immediately find each other in that app automatically. That's that's crazy. That's that's the kind of revolutionary uh, quality of life improvement that only Urban is able to provide, and and it's one of the reasons why I'm so excited by it. That it's an awesome future you're describing. What I can't help but think about is that centralization of Urban produces the one man risk. What what is it called? The the key man risk of like it's only Urbit. What if Urbit goes down? Right. Is how I'm thinking. Okay. Sure. That's so what I see the, where you're thinking. I see where you're because thinking. Yeah. The centralized Twitter and Instagram, it the way you're describing it, it's like awful that you have to have all these different things. But it does provide the benefit, let's say someone gets banned on Twitter mm -hmm. while they have their Instagram account. So yeah, so what's the I, I see where you're going with it, but I think the key thing to to know is that Urban is a de is it's a protocol. It's it's gotcha. just code. It's just decentralized code, right? So anyone could make a new Urban. You could make a new Urban if you wanted to, right? Um, so there's not a one man risk okay. problem because there's not one corporation or one entity managing it. It's it's literally just a bunch of code that people choose to download onto their computer, and when everyone downloads it onto their computer, they can find each other and connect with each other uh, through this decentralized mesh net. And if if some, let's say, I mean, one, one th failure mode you could think about to be charitable to your concern here is you could imagine one bad scenario where maybe somehow it just so happens that one person on the network gets a ton of power. Mm -hmm. Maybe they, you know, they just are able to accumulate, um, a, a lot of the, the address space, meaning the, the identities, maybe one, maybe one person goes and accumulates half of the identities and that person has way more power than all the other people on the network. And then they're able to manipulate things into like a bad state or something. And the, net the network goes bad or something like that. Um, not a crazy, um, thing to be concerned about. Right. But then you could, the other half of the network could just say, Oh, okay. Yeah. We're going to make a new orbit and that's over here now. And, and if there, if the end result is there's two different orbits because there are two, you know, camps in the world that want fundamentally different architectures, that's a beautiful thing too. That's yeah. fine too, right? Yeah. So, so yeah, there's. There, I would say there's 
there's fundamentally no risk of the kind that you were initially kind of thinking about because you can always just fork it and do something else with the with the underlying software. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing, and it it's it's makes me think about the idea of you're living in the future of like it seems like more people will do this in the future than currently do it. How do you decide how much time to spend on the Web two platforms versus what I assume is a Web three platform in Urbit? Yeah, it's a great question. I think about that a lot, I, but I think the answer is ultimately pretty simple. You know, so long as all the eyeballs are on on the the the, the boomer web, then <laughs> then yeah, you should be publishing your work to the boomer web. Yeah. I think you know. Um, but I tend to think that you should be building your private community on the avant garde of of technological possibility. That that's kind of how I split the difference, because if you go too quickly all in on these newfangled technologies, there's a few different problems. I mean, one is just that you don't know for sure which which is ex which is really going to win, right? Um, I'm quite bullish on Urbit, but the, in other um, uh, dimensions of this game, there are um, other decisions you have to make which are unclear, right? Like what, you know, uh, is Ethereum going to be the place where all of the, you know, Web3 creator tools are living or is it going to be, you know, uh, something else? Are they going to build smart contracts onto Bitcoin one day? You know, who, who knows, right? And so there's a ton of uncertainty. And so you don't want to go to all in on any one proposition at this moment just because it's still so early and, 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 and the future is uncertain, right? Um, so yeah, I, I tend to think, you know, have a have a web 2.0 kind of outpost, a, a traditional, you know, published to the clear web, the, the boomer web and have, an, have a web 2.0 outpost. And then when it comes to the more radical asymmetric bets, you know, play with a, a few of the ones that you think are most promising and put a little a bit of effort into playing with them and building on a few of them. But really, you're just waiting to see what shakes out before you make any like really big bet on anyone. That's how I think about it. The way I look at it is like you're building a blog in 2000 and people would be like, why are you blogging? It's 2000. Like, it's cool. People have internet presence, but like, what, what's a blog? And then you fast forward to 2005, 2006, 2007, and all of a sudden, everybody in the world is blogging and it's the most popular thing. Is very similar to how I think you're living. Are there any previous examples in your own life where you've been ahead of the curve by five years, where you've been surprised by, wow, mm. I picked up something quicker than other people did? Well, yes and no. I mean, I would say that my wager leaving academia was a little ahead of the curve in the sense that it was only after I left academia that you saw, for instance, the Substack revolution. Mm. And with the Substack revolution, you saw a bunch of professional journalists with really cushy, high prestige jobs at somewhere like the New York Times, quitting those jobs to be essentially independent creators. That that all happened after I left academia. And so, you know, when I left academia, there was Patreon, right? That was kind of the moment that I left academia when Patreon was really, you know, taking off and there were there were some people doing quite well on Patreon. Um, but the Substack stuff had not occurred. There were, there were not many public defections from high prestige professions mm. into the creator economy at the time that I left academia. So I, I, I give myself a little bit of credit for having some prescience there. Uh, I, I saw that coming before it happened. So I'll take a little bit of credit there, but I'll also give you a, a self-deprecating example of, of one that I got wrong. And which, which in a way, you know, if you can, if you can remember when you were badly wrong about the future, it's almost just as good as being as remembering when you were right about the future, because it's just what not to do, right? So I'll give you an example that I just I can never stop thinking about. I think about this every day almost. Um, when I was when I was like first year as a professor, when I first you know made it, uh, got my highly coveted competitive you know ten year track gig and moved to England. It was in England. I remember. So this would have been in 2014. I remember um, walking to campus one day, and I was. Uh, you know, I, I, I listened to a podcast that I like dug up to do some research on this thing called Bitcoin, which I heard about. I was intrigued, you know, I was curious. And uh, I remember downloading onto my phone a podcast so I could, you know, kind of think about it um, and, and learn about it on my walk to work. And I remember, I remember like the block that I was on when I was just thinking like, huh, should I buy some of this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and, I, and I remember just thinking, Nah, it's probably bullshit. And and 
the reason it sticks with me and the reason I recall this frequently is because my my skepticism and rejection of it, not even considering it worth my time to buy like a few hundred dollars of it just to play with it, just in the modesty of wanting to learn and wanting to explore further. Mm. In my rejection of that, just carte blanche, there was a tremendous amount of arrogance mm. and it was specifically linked to my newfound stature as a professor. I, I really do. I really do think it was it was a sense of I'm too good for this. I have real work to do. You know, I'm you know, I'm I'm a professional. You know, I need to be focused on the real stuff. That's 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 important. Uh, you know, and I, this was this was kind of the mentality. I looked down on it. I looked down on it. I was like, it's not worth it to spend. It's going to take me like three hours to figure out like local Bitcoin dot com and like go make the transaction. It's going to take me like three or four hours to figure that out. It's not worth my time. These are losers. These aren't <laughs> professors. You know, these are losers. These are weird. These are weird, sketchy people um, doing 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 this weird stuff. Right. And that that was very much the mentality. And yeah, I mean, had I bought like a thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin that day, my life would be significantly different right now economically. And in just in terms of my power and independence and autonomy, had I just had a different attitude that day and bought a thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin that day. And so I just love that example of, um, you know, how I really, really failed to see something for, for all of the wrong reasons. And after that, like, basically I just have pledged to myself to never let that happen again. So now like when there's cool stuff, that's really interesting and new. And it really does seem like from an honest detached perspective, like, Oh, this could actually be really important and valuable. I will now, I will always give it that, that four or five hours of like really trying to learn it, figure it out deeply, and then really make an independent assessment about whether or not I think it's it's promising uh, because of that lesson that I learned. That's a really cool story. <laughs> I'm really happy you shared that. And it makes me think, wow, I got to check out Urbit right after this. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> no, but the reason why I say it is because the initial reaction could be like, I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense to me. And right. then the second reaction should be, okay, let me look into it. And it just reminds me of all the things that are cool in society often start out as not cool or weird. If you look at like the most recent trend of like TikTok, for example, how many people said that's a silly thing or a dumb thing or that's just for kids. And then all of a sudden it's something that's widespread part of culture. And that's part of the Web2 ecosystem and mm -hmm. not and something you're fighting against or you see sure. as something not good, quote unquote. But it's also something that explains it. it's a similar situation. You see this with people too. It's like, you know, Mr. Beast or Logan Paul. And it's like, those were people who were weird or, totally. and now they're the biggest stars in the world. Totally. Yeah. No, I think that's absolutely right. I love it. And I think what you said before about blogging, the early days of blogging is also a really good example. Yeah. It's so what was interesting to me was seeing how you looked at technology as either to quote you is technological innovation, a nuclear bomb or a consumer television. Can you explain that statement from a, a blog post from, I don't know when it was, but. Uh, which which one was it? So I'm, I'm not sure the title of it. I'll put it down in the show That's notes right. below. But in the, in the post, you made the example that a nuclear bomb is something that grows and it's technology, right? but it explodes. Right, right. And a consumer television gets better and better and better the more you use it. Right, right. Okay, thank you for jogging my memory. I, I, say, I, I say You something. write you write some yeah. things and you're like, what, what, did, what I know, did I mean I, by that? I say, I say a lot of things and uh, don't always remember what I meant. So, <laughs> But now I remember. So, right. So, yeah, if you look at how technologies generally unfold over time, they often follow this kind of logistical S-curve, mm. right? Um, in the early days, it's very slow. Then all of a sudden it hits and, and, and flex upward fast. And then it kind of slopes off as it reaches saturation, right? And so that's... That's the TV. That's the radio. That's things like this. Um, that's a common pattern that, that's that you see. That's uh, TikTok. Yeah, probably. We're Presu on that. Curve. Presumably, right, right. And and so yeah, that's that's a that's what's called a logistic curve or a logistic function, also known informally as as an S curve. And then you know there are uh, explosive processes which are you know less uh, manageable basically, and so. If you think of the TV as a case study of how you can have kind of explosive exponential growth in a technology, mm. but then it but then it kind of stabilizes and when it reaches saturation, right? Because there's only so many people, and once everyone has a TV, you know, there's not really anywhere else for the TV to go, right? So the TV was a kind of explosive growth in that part of the that that fast rising part of the of the S curve. Mm -hmm. um, it's a kind of 
explosive takeoff, but it's but it saturates and it's a kind of manageable phenomenon, right? Mm. It's not like um, you know the world ended because of too many TVs, right? Uh, but if you look at something like a nuclear explosion, right? Um, it's a it's a it's 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 a somewhat similar process in that there's clearly a kind of uh, takeoff. There's an exponential takeoff, a a a process like that. Um, but ra- but but it's it's destructive, right? And it it um, you know it can't be managed. There there's not there's not a point in the curve where it becomes you know smoothly integrated, b- mm. but it just kind of destroys everything around it. Right. So I'm I'm being somewhat informal with the mathematics. Like I, I'm not intending this and I didn't intend this in the essay to be some kind of like uh, formal mathematical model. I'm, Thought I'm, experiment. Yeah, I would even uh, be less generous and just say it, it's uh, uh, really the, these are just a kind of colorful ways of, of describing two different things, basically. And so the question is, you know, when we think about any given, you know, kind of technological acceleration, I like to ask myself, are we looking at a TV or are we looking at a nuclear bomb, right? Is this something that's just going to kind of grow, saturate, and then be managed and integrated? Or is this something that's going to uh, explode and devastate? So that that's kind of the mental model there. When you look at something like the internet, it's like, I, I something Naval said a long time ago really stuck with me, which is, that if you extrapolate the future long enough, everyone will be able to 3D print a nuclear bomb. Mm. And that freaked me out to no end because obviously it's not tomorrow, right. but the idea that people will be able to do that at some point in the future just screams like a, a bad idea for humanity. And how, do you think about, how do you think about the end of the world or, mm. or the end of civilization? I know we talked about fun topics to start. Sure, but. yeah. Well, I do think that we're living through an apocalypse, <laughs> the apocalypse. Yeah. I think I think technological acceleration, I mean if you look at just the growth curves since, you know, the renaissance, right? It's like you, you know, I'm sure your listeners might may or may not know, but it's like most of human history, economic growth, if you look at the plot, it's like a flat line for yeah. like all of human history. Yeah. And then right around like the 1700s it just goes up, right? Crazy. Goes up crazy, which is awesome, right? I, I'm I'm definitely not like an anti-progress person or or whatever. Like, no, that's amazing. It's given us wonderful things, right? Um, but also, like, where do where does everyone think that that's going, right? It's like um, explosive. It's it, it's explosive, right? And so, what it's doing is it's basically um, accelerating the separation of of the good and the bad, the true and the false. And it's pretty biblical. I, I, I think it's it's quite literally um, and quite explicitly what the Bible <laughs> leads us to predict more Go or less. Go on that. Well, you know, if, if you look at like the late uh, writings of Rene Girard, you know, uh, his, final, his final book is actually a collection of interviews. It's called Battling to the End. And, you know, this is basically what he says. You know, this is a very sophisticated, um, you know, literary critic and, and kind of... Uh, a kind of anthropologist and, you know, a very successful, influential academic, right? At, at the end of his life says, you know, actually everything the Bible said about, you know, the apocalypse is is basically coming true. And I also like St. Augustine. Uh, I, I think the the idea of the city of God and the city of earth is something that I often go back to. I think it's a useful way to uh, kind of just uh, describe what we're talking about here. And if you look at Augustine, you know, what he seems to think is that over time, um, there are these kind of causal these these natural empirical causal processes. It's not we're not talking about like faith or some magical mysterious hand of God thing. Like if you look if you read Augustine closely, he seems to be saying, and I think this is correct, is that you know um, if you are a good person or if you tell the truth, you're going to kind of go in a certain direction, mm. and you're going to tend to go in that direction with other people who are good people and who are virtuous people and who tell the truth. And those people are going to kind of tend to go to one way. And then the people who are liars and who are, you know, not virtuous people and the people who are, you know, who who are evil, essentially, or have seeds of evil that who who, who indulge the seeds of evil inside of all of us, that those people who indulge those seeds of evil are going to tend to go off in a different direction and they're going to tend to do it together. Mm. And so that's the city of earth, you know, people who just want power and comfort and, you know, the the carnal pleasures. That's basically the city of Earth. That's that's essentially the path of evil. And the people who, you know, uh, try to live a genuinely virtuous life and always tell the truth, even if it's uncomfortable and will always be virtuous and truthful, even if, 
you know, it's not utilitarian to do so. Those people are, that's the city of God. And, and I, I, you know, some people think that this is like, you know, very low status to, to take these types of like religious ideas seriously or whatever. But I think if you're, if, if we're really honest with ourselves and you look at the 20th century, I feel like the, this mental model of St. Augustine has never been more empirically validated because I feel like it's, it, we're seeing, we're seeing this and we're seeing it with the private community phenomenon with the creator economy. It's like, it goes back to the beginning of our conversation where I said that reality itself or, or society as we know it is being forked in you know a million different directions by a million different creators and their communities this is a battle for re- the, the soul of reality essentially this is this is a kind of apocalyptic separation where everyone is going to be scrambling to try to survive to make it through this bottleneck and frankly i think the good and the true are going to win mm-hmm. and the the false and the bad are going to get absolutely wrecked worse and worse and i think you're already seeing it i think you're already seeing it and in, in and here's an example like you know, if you look at all of the people who have kind of defected from institutions to tell the truth, to build a community and a lifestyle that they genuinely believe is virtuous and more aligned with the the good life and the true life, those people are crushing it. They're doing right. They're, think about it. They're like these are the healthy people. These are the rich people. These are the new types of rich people. These are the crypto people. These are the. the these, How do you explain Nancy Pelosi? These people are like taking over the new world. And then you look at the institutions. You look at yeah. you look at everyone who's still in the institutions who are still mentally and emotionally invested in the old institutions, which basically require you to lie. Mm. That's one of the kind of defining characteristics of modern bureaucracies. Is you kind of to function within those machines. You have to be constantly telling little fibs and white lies to paper over everything to make it function, basically. Mm. And so all the people in those institutions are increasingly suffering, and 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 their and their their lives, you know, financially and emotionally and psychologically, are increasingly worse and worse. And they're more and more miserable, and they're actually acting in more and more desperate ways. And in, in a way, that's one way to diagnose the whole kind of like crazy woke phenomenon is like uh, this is a kind of like desperate gasp of of insanity by people who are really on the wrong track and deeply deeply suffering so if you want to raise an example like someone like nancy pelosi that you know there are there is a small elite minority of people who are at the top of that dying pyramid right Mm -hmm. and so but she's profiting right like well sure right so profiting externally with money but sure and it's a fair point there there can be if you have a very massive ship but it's a sinking ship there can still be a lot of riches on that ship to 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 extract on the way down while it's sinking, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's how I would think about it. I would think about the entire institutional inheritance, all of society as we know it that has been accumulated in the modern period in these kind of modern uh, mega bureaucracies, right? That's kind of what describes modernity. That, that's kind of the essence of, of modern institutions, modern organization, modern society is the rise of massive bureaucratic entities, whether it's militaries or corporations or, or or governments. You know, if you think about that entire machinery, all of that social and cultural and economic capital in that massive boat, if you will, um, that's, it's a massive, massive boat, no doubt. It's been accumulated over a long period of time. And frankly, for many years, you know, it did create value. It was better than what came before. So it rightfully earned and aggregated and accumulated it a lot of value and it mm-hmm. holds a lot of value. It's a massive boat, right? Think of it as a massive boat. Well, now that boat is sinking and it is a sinking ship, but it's still a big boat and big boats take a long time to sink. That That's basically how I think about it. And so if you happen to have a life trajectory or a life position where you're like the captain of that boat. Mm. Yeah, you can still live a life of luxury. Uh, you can still have a beautiful mansion that 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 that's functioning, and you can still have a massive, you know, uh, wealth and income advantage, even if you're on the sinking ship. But only a small minority of the ship's captains can can have that, you know, luxurious life on that sinking ship. Everyone else on the ship is desperate and angry and resentful and crazy. Mm. And that's what you're seeing. That, that, that's ex- exactly what you're seeing. And call me crazy, but it's, I think, uh, pretty explicitly what people like St. Augustine foretold, basically, that, that there would be, over time, um, an increasing, accelerating separation of, of the good and the true from the false and the bad. And technology is just bringing about that separation at a faster and faster rate. And that is what the apocalypse is, essentially, is, is when that that separation um, really reaches uh, a high point where it it's it's all getting separated and all is being revealed. That That's what the apocalypse is. 
uh, to actually technically etymologically, you know, apocalypse is not necessarily a bad thing. People use it colloquially mm. to mean like, oh, a bad thing. Um, but that's not what all it means is revealing. It's 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 the it's the revealing of 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 what is what, and you know, that's I think what we're living through. <laughs> I I love that analogy, and I I feel that to be true. But my one criticism of it is that humans inherently we are both good and bad, and there are parts of us sure. that is bad. There are parts of us that's good. And we are not always on one track or the other. We sometimes in one day go from bad to good. Oh, I should have gone to the gym. Oh, I shouldn't have ate that. Oh, and then, oh, wow, I, I am on my routine. Or it, so it varies is, is how it <clears throat> appears to me. So my of question course. to you is how do we lean more towards the good life that you're talking about and lean more towards the side of truth and more towards the side of, of good? Huh. Well, that's that's a million dollar question. That's what uh, you know everyone has been trying to figure out forever, right? The ever since you know the earliest philosophers, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think I have any alpha over the great <laughs> philosophers, right? I mean, they're yeah. I, I don't I don't pretend to have any easy, compelling, you know, life advice about how to how to be more good or true. Um, that's a con you're absolutely right. That's a constant struggle, and we all yeah we do have good and evil inside of us. And it's just not my expertise to have some kind of compelling answer to that. I, I don't think that I, you know, I have my own, I guess my own little tricks or my own little, little ways of trying to do it, but I don't have anything particularly compelling or profound on that. Well, I'd love to hear, like, what do you do when you find yourself fa falling more towards the evil side of things? Well, what do you, yeah. You know, I, what's the next step? I mean, I, again, this is old as can be and not interesting or profound at all, but I do like the, the, the really classic uh, Christian dictum that the truth will set you free. I think that that uh, makes a ton of sense. I think it's empirically accurate. It's not a mystical thing at all. That's not You don't need to necessarily believe in God for to see that that's a, an absolutely true statement. And I think it is. And so that's, I think, the easiest heuristic to always default to. If you just always tell the truth no matter what, or you just, you know, obviously no one's perfect and um, you don't, you know, it's it's highly, highly uh, Im impractical to tell the truth radically every single second of the day. So very few people can do that or very few people want to do that. But in times of uncertainty, in times where, you know, you're slipping, in times where you feel like life is uh, getting beyond you or you're going down wrong paths, um, I, I tend to think the best single maxim to always go back to is is, is to recall that, that the truth will set you free. And generally, if things are not going well, and you decide to just one way or another, just take a chance on speaking the truth a little bit more than you're comfortable with, always go in that direction. If you do that, generally it has a way of sorting out um, all, all the other problems and getting you back on on the straight and narrow, as it were, on the good path. So that's probably my single favorite heuristic, uh, that the truth will set you free. And always, always bet on that if you're unsure. It's funny because you said I'm spending too much time on Twitter or I'm getting too sucked onto the, into the internet. And you writing that down is almost like you acknowledging the truth and saying, okay, this is where my problem is. And I was having a conversation with someone last night where he was telling me about a problem he was facing. And I said to him, and he said that was the first time he had, he had acknowledged that as a problem. And I said to him, that's the most challenging part, acknowledging that that's a problem and because that means you have to do something about it. That means that I'm going to follow up with you in 24 hours about that problem. That means that you, some action, you have some accountability in that moment, whether or not you do something about it. Yeah. Also, you know what? Telling the truth in difficult ways usually creates certain problems in certain ways. And that those problems have a way of removing themselves from you in a way. So mm. if that was unclear, what I mean by that is when you're trying to be everything to everyone, you know, and you're trying to make everyone happy, you're trying to do everything you can for everyone. Yeah, you start to get overwhelmed. And, um, you know, you're constantly too busy and stressed out. And, and you're probably doing some things that are not actually even worth doing. And so if you just increase the amount of truth you tell to a little bit higher degree, to the point that's a little uncomfortable, you're going to upset some people. And that's good, because those people are going to go away. Basically, <laughs> like they're not going to be interested in you anymore. Right. And so it's like, the truth, speaking the truth uncomfortably, so has this salutary effect of repelling some people mm. and 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 some um, issues and and circumstances and events. And you know, it's it's 
it's sometimes useful to repel a certain number of people and and entities. <laughs> well, that's that's such a fascinating thing because if you do enough podcasts, <laughs> if you speak enough times, if you yeah. do enough blog posts, if you yeah. you're going to upset people. It's, you it's, should. You if, should. If you're being truthful, right? You so. can definitely churn out, you know, uh, gruel that that doesn't upset anyone and is just like makes everyone feel happy and good. Right? Do you feel some pride in upsetting people? Definitely. Yeah, I, I probably don't do it enough actually. Now, now that I, you know, we just had a kid about seven months ago, my first kid, and you know, I've become a little bit more of like a family man. Now I'm like <laughs> kind of ashamed of that I'm I've, I've gotten soft a little bit. Like I I haven't really offended anyone in, in recent memory, maybe a little bit, but um, yeah, no, I definitely you should take pride in offending people. Of course, the the key condition here is that it's because you say something that you truly believe is true. You mm-hmm. know that, and, and you think it's you know that's that's the key thing. You can get kind of you know addicted to ruffling people's feathers to the point that you just start saying any trolling stuff. Um, and that's probably not healthy or good. And I, I don't admire that, but, um, but yeah, generally if I, if I think something is really true and I say it and it ups, upsets people, I enjoy that. Yeah. Justin. Well, unfortunately we're out of time here today. Oh, I can keep fast. going. Okay. <laughs> this, this flew by, but where can we send people to connect with you further? Oh, uh, just uh, my newsletter is my main thing. Otherlife.co. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. We'll plug that below otherlife.co. And I appreciate you so much. The the talks and the way you speak and the things you talk about remind me that we're living through a crazy time. And you have, it feels like from my perspective, a little cusp or an eye poke into the future. So I'm really grateful to experience that today. Well, I appreciate you inviting me out. This was fun. And uh, yeah, just thanks, thanks for having me, man. Hell yeah. <laughs> cool, dude.